Dud Balapur, I'm uh, from Mellanox. I'm an application performance uh, manager. So welcome back from lunch, and uh, I hope you had coffee as well. <laughs> so we, I can stay awake and you can stay awake as well. Um, so I want to keep this interactive a little bit. So I'm going to be asking some questions, um, some raise of hands. So before um, I cover the big data side, um, I would like to understand how many of you are actively participating in any of the big data uh, projects, um, either Hadoop or any of the other stuff. So any raise of hands so far? That's good. OK. So I can kind of go over the content a little bit um, in introduction, um, so a little more detail um, and s simplify it a little better uh, to make, s make it understandable. OK. So um, I think there are enough speakers who have already covered most of the Mellanox side. But um, the key things from this slide are the 56 gig, um, not only just IB, we're going to be doing Ethernet as well. Um, and I think that that's mentioned here in the green. And the switches and the storage from the front to back end. So I'm not going to go over a whole lot of, lot of detail in this. But one thing I want to clearly emphasize with this slide is even though this just has the components, my main focus is on the solution providing side. So I look at the apps in detail, um, and I go through every vendor apps from big data perspective, open them up, you know, go through the performance uh, metrics around it, understand the application about, you know, in a lot more detail, and then kind of um, write white papers on that. OK? So to cover big data, um, today we're actually covering um, mainly the Hadoop framework. Um, even though we deal with Big Insight and all the other frameworks, but predominantly on the big data side, um, this is coming up everywhere, and which is Apache Hadoop. And you must have heard different names across, um, like Big Insight, Cloudera, um, you know, Hortonworks, but underneath all of these, there is Apache Hadoop as a base. Now, to cover what really is Hadoop, right? Um, you're all familiar with uh, the distributed file system. Uh, so if it's predominantly HPC, you're familiar with Lustre, correct? In this case, we're talking HDFS, which is Hadoop distributed file system. So it's in most of the typical HPC side, it's mainly the compute and you have a storage on the back. Whereas over here, we're bringing the data to where the compute is and then basically making it available um, immediately. So that way, the data is spread across all the nodes. So the, the only change from the HPC side is what we see is the nodes have the disks inside them. And the data lives inside that. And that basically, the tying up of all the data with, between the nodes, that's what um, HDFS uh, does in this case. Let me find a pointer. So um, Hadoop has basically two sets of components. One is the HDFS layer, which is purely a file system, um, which ties everything together. And then there's an analytics framework called MapReduce. And then you have HBase and Hive and Pig. And there are a lot more add-ons to this. So anything beyond HDFS and MapReduce, you will see, you will hear a lot of funny names. Um, they're all like Hive, Pig. And, and I'll, I'll just go into one detail on why it's called Pig. Um, essentially, the pig can eat anything. And in this case, that's his. That's essentially why they're named pig. And they're like different names like that. And HBase is um, basically a database over you know, MapReduce and things like that. So why Hadoop, right? Um, so the, the goal is to bring an analytics framework on, on the distributed side and make it you know, available uh, to make it run faster. And the key thing is flexibility, store data, any data, run any analysis. Scalability, start from one terabyte to three nodes to grow to petabytes, right? And then economics, you know, the cost per terabyte, a fraction of uh, traditional options. 
because you're kind of splitting that storage um, from the back end into the nodes and then storing the data. And from a high performance, um, rather high availability and performance, you know, it, it actually is much better. So what's, what's the motivation for the big data framework, right? So the big motivation here is data analysis requires faster network. You know, from our perspective, what we have seen is everything that's out there on the internet is pretty much becoming big data. Um, so the term actually big is going away as we speak. Uh, the reason why I say this is because, so the, the latest analysis, you know, uh, it's a wrong example today, but actually, you know, I'll, I'll just state it. So the Boston bombings, they were able to come down and narrow it so fast because they had just 10 terabytes of data with them. It was a combination of pictures, combination of tweets, combination of web data that was out there, extremely unstructured, right? They took all that stuff, they, they ran the analysis of it, and they came back and they processed. So that, that's why I say the term big is going away. Um, it's, it's pretty small, um, you know, small subsets of data, and running at very high performance levels, you know, getting the real-time analysis, so it's, it's requires faster network. And typically, I'll go into more details on why MapReduce framework requires a network-intensive uh, workload. Um, the data replication. Now, if you think about a 1,000 nodes of data living everywhere, and then you start replicating it like three times, five times, well, however, you know, how much ever you need, that generates a lot of network traffic within the nodes. And also, the I.O. can be pretty hot at during that time. So that's why this is the main motivation for high performance networks here. And then big data and HPC share similar characteristics. But one thing that we're seeing very interesting in the HPC side is the distributed uh, systems like Luster and OrangeFS, which I'll cover a little more in detail. What's happening is even though the data lives there, there's not that many analytics uh, stuff that's being done. Now we're seeing a lot of interest where they're started, starting to look at the data that lived on Luster and to start sort of running some analysis on using MapReduce framework. So m we see more and more people from HPC side looking at this and going, ah, oh, we can do the same thing. We already know how to do this. All we need to do is basically run you know, MapReduce stuff on top of it, and I can do my analytics. And here's an example of how, you know, the customers are using it, right? So 235 supermarkets, 59,000 employees, lots of stores. And if you want real-time coupon generation that matters to the customer as and when he's checking out, you need this. So that's, that's one of the examples. So in future, if, you, if you're looking for some deals, don't be surprised. Yeah, as long as there's location awareness and you know what you're looking for, it's going to be really tailored to you. And they're, they're analyzing everything. So for example, if you go to, today to Walmart looking at you know, big television sets, they're actually looking at the camera and analyzing whether you're a real buyer or whether you're just window shopping, just looking through, right? They're doing tons of analysis right now. Okay, so um, this is a more technical stuff. So um, I, to go back to the earlier slide here, the MapReduce, that is the analytics framework, right? The file system is just a plain, plain old file system, except it's distributed. So I'm not going to go into more of this, but I'll explain the MapReduce side. So uh, how does really MapReduce work, right? So there's data ingestion here that starts. And then you basically ingest the data with, you know, which generates uh, map output files. And then there's a shuffle and a map phase that kind of goes through in the same state. And there's merge, and then there's reduce. Now, for somebody who's not familiar with big data, this is a lot of stuff. It's, it's just like shuffle, merge, map, reduce. What, what are all this, right? So I've tried to simplify that. Um, 
I will come back to this. Now let's take a look, look here, right? This is a very, very simplified example of what MapReduce does. So for instance, if I have data of um, the big clusters, what are they using and how many kind of interfaces of uh, XYZ they're using? So I asked a question, what is the predominant interface that's being used in HPC cluster, for instance, right? And I, I have a three text files, for example, you know, which has just the interface names. That's it, period. So when I take this three files, put it into MapReduce framework, I run through this, and it runs as three map tasks, right? And then it splits it and starts red, the shuffle fa phase where all it does is basically takes each of this data and splits it into different pieces and shuffles them accordingly. Like basically it's like sorting. And then once the sorting portion is done, then there's a reduce tasks that happens. So for each of these interfaces, how much count do I get? And then eventually the output comes out as one out output file. Any questions around here? It's, it's, it's very simple. But this is extremely simplified um, explanation of MapReduce. But um, one thing to remember here is this data is pretty, it can be very unstructured. Um, it, it could be photos, contents, you know, it doesn't matter. It, it, it can take all that, split it into key value pairs, go through that, and eventually give you the output files what you're asking. So you, you can be asking questions like, what is the hottest day? You know, from the day you have the data till date. And it'll come back and with an answer saying, this was the hottest day that was recorded. OK, so um, the, the two portions of the MapReduce, which is shuffle, um, is what happens during the shuffle is all the nodes to nodes, there's a lot of transfer, data transfer that's happening. Um, the reason behind this is every node that it stores the data, it stores simply blocks. It does not have the metadata of what it files belongs to. So it simply splits, like if you say, split my data into 64 you know, KB segments, it'll simply split those and store it as tiny, tiny files across all the nodes. So there's a lot of data transfer that's going on between the nodes. And it needs to coexist with the map and merge workload because it stays right here. There's the mapper, there's a red user. So there's a lot of cross traffic that's going on. And the merge does the heavy lifting of the map data that was existing, so, and then inserts into the intermediate uh, phase. And then once it's done, it, it basically comes to the reduce phase. So uh, the merge also is memory bound, you know, heavily. So if you look at average gig -E clusters, they typically have eight gig or 16 gig per nodes. But what I'm gonna cover here is the more the memory, the better in our case, which I'll go into a lot, little more detail. Okay, so this was a work um, done in conjunction with Auburn University. Um, it was called Network Levitated Merge Algorithm. Um, one thing from a vanilla Hadoop perspective, the, the notion is that you buy cheap hardware, you know, you pretty much keep the nodes pretty plain and simple with eight gig of memory, and you put a giggy and you will run and you can do the job. But that's not cutting anymore uh, because of a lot of things that I explained before because we're kind of going real time and there's more and more data coming inside. Um, there's more analysis being performed. Now with what Auburn University did is they came up with something called network levitated merge. Uh, in simple words, basically all the shuffle uh, is done up front, right? And the merge points, the key headers are taken here and puts it in a priority queue, and once it's done, you know, it takes that. This is typical uh, what happens in UDL. I'll go into more detail. But what it really does is essentially it utilizes the RDMA underneath the covers where Hadoop by default does not have that capability. So it basically 
removes the, the uh, intermediate shuffle phase that's happening at the disk layer, bringing it to memory, and then doing it at a memory level so that it happens much faster because the lowest component you know, denominator in any of these nodes is the hard disk, which is pretty slow, right? So here with the network levitated merge, we're kind of moving that data from the disk level to the memory, and we're getting most of the stuff done there, and then we're getting the results out. So here's an example. So in order for us to do this, um, what happens in vanilla Hadoop is that when the map area starts, the reducers also start right here. In my earlier slide, if I go back, I can show you. So what, what's happening here is it's starting the mappers, but also it's starting the reducers at the same time. So when things are not done, you know, it keeps going back and starting the data. So it's a double traffic that it's kind of doing. And here, what we're trying to do is do not finish or start with the reducers until you're done with all the mappings first. Then we will take that data once it start, started out, and then we will do it within the memory of the nodes, and then we will reduce that and go through the shuffle merge and pretty much give the output, which is very, very fast compared to the earlier approach where there are intermediate files written every single time that it's sorting. So the product um, that we took what Auburn did, essentially um, made it into an accelerator. And it's, it's completely open source. Um, so anybody can download the code today and pretty much contribute or uh, take this and launch this into a full-blown product if they need to. So as long as they have RDMA, they will be able to use the product. So it, the key thing to remember is there are different you know, components here within Hadoop. We only have UDA in this section. Nothing to do here, it's only here. That's the key thing to remember because most of the analytics, um, no matter whether you use Hedgepace, um, Hive, any of these, there's a portion of analytics that run through the MapReduce and that's where UDA comes in. And it's an excellent shuffle provider, you know, other than the vanilla shuffle provider. It works over RDMA, and it supports InfiniBand and Ethernet, right? And going forward today, as of today, um, if you use any of the older distributions, you have to do uh, a bit of uh, work in order to integrate the UDA and use it. But going forward, the good news is that it, it will be in the Apache main trunk so that the future releases of Hadoop will be RDMA enabled. Um, so all you have to do is it might just be a switch. You turn it on and you start using and UDA kicks in instantly. So we're, we're already in the 3.0 trunk, 2.03 trunk, anything lower, we have uh, install guides and everything laid out on the white paper so you can actually download and use it. And these are the distributions we support, um, anything from Cloudera, Apache, Hortonworks. And of course, once this, this portion is out completely, it's going to be in every distribution, whether it's big inside, whether it's you know, uh, any of the other distributions. And the supported hardware is ConnectX 3 VPI and SwitchX uh, Base 2. But if you want to simply try out just from an RDMA perspective, if you have uh, OFED that supports RDMA. I will go into more details on how UDA is working because Hadoop is written only in Java. Um, there is no C++ code in um, Hadoop. Whereas with UDA, there is a portion of C++ code that talks to the OFED driver, um, and then there is a portion that works with the MapReduce framework. Okay, so here's the software architecture that I was trying to explain. So um, every Hadoop framework, um, the, the distributions, they have something called a name node, a data node, and 
task tracker, job tracker. The task tracker is typically is the, the workhorse that does the analytics portion on each of the nodes, right? So it runs a map task, then it runs a reduce task, and job tracker takes care of you know, running the jobs for you. And when a job is over from the cluster, it kind of reports saying, hey, your start is done, and I finished it within a certain amount, and here's my report, right? That's the job of job tracker. Now, what typically what happens is this, this is vanilla. Um, this is all that happens. Now, you integrate UDA, what happens is there's a C++ plugin that kind of goes in as a shared library, and it uses the map task, splits it over, gives it to RDMA server, which uses the RDMA you know, capability, and typically what we see is the nodes um, where we're going from 8 gig to 16 gig, you can have 64 gig of memory here, and it uses that portion of the memory to do all your uh, sorting uh, framework. So that way it happens much faster. So it finishes that, goes back to the RDMA client and says I'm done, and here's the merging thread, and here's the final reduce task. You know, just go and give the output file. Okay, so w besides just the RDMA capabilities, what are the real key advantages of UDA, right? So the, the main one is the performance. It's, it's essentially 2x faster. So for example, if you run a terabyte sort, typically on a six node cluster, it takes like a half, you know, maybe an hour or so, right? Whereas you use UDA, it, it, it runs within half an hour. So what does that come down to the business level, right? So any analytics that you run um, is going to be 2x faster, which means if you are trying to do anything with real time, it's going to basically be much faster in coming back with the results so you can process it much earlier. Because time is of a sense when you are looking at some time like real data. So the earlier example I gave you, it's a classic case where they really needed information and everybody, the whole world was watching at them saying, what are they, how are they going to catch these guys, right? And, and that's going to be really the key here. Uh, how much of our data you feed in, um, it comes back with the right answers and this is how it helps. Now, other main advantages is, sorry, um, other main advantage is that um, in vanilla Hadoop, um, if anybody has uh, played around with it, it's, it's extremely hard to tune to different size jobs. So what I mean by that is, if you have jobs that are like 10 gig files, which are many files, and then you have huge 10 terabyte files, um, which are coming in to the uh, cluster, the administrator is gonna have a total nightmare to fine tune the, the um, cluster. So basically what they do is they set up vanilla Hadoop and then they tell the developer, hey, based on what job you're submitting, use these, these parameters and the cluster will behave. But seldom that does not happen. You, you see timeouts occurring, you see um, you know, job failures and all sorts of issues. With UDA, you set up for one part of the balance in the middle and you live it and you don't need to necessarily touch the cluster after that. So a lot of administrators night, nightmare of tuning every, you know, the entire cluster for each of the jobs goes away essentially and it makes uh, his job a lot more easier. So this, I think, um, DK Panda, um, Doc, Dr. DK Panda just covered, went through this. Um, this, is, uh, this is with uh, Ohio State University. We, we uh, took the HDFS file system. Um, by default, there's no RDMA enabled in the file system. Um, now we're kind of getting the RDMA portion into the HDFS, so that way it can utilize and run much faster. So you can get higher throughput um, from the disks. Now, one of the issues I do see, that I, I see more and more customers using SSDs uh, for their solutions. Uh, so any of the big guys who are doing any analytics um, out there, they are more and more going with the SSD solutions. So they just have like two 
you know, PCI Express SSDs per node because they need immediate results um, when they run through. So they need better you know, connectivity and throughput. And even though they use the vanilla framework, they're not able to get that um, you know, uh, going forward. So here's some interesting results. Um, like I said, in Hadoop, you have a block size which you can tune. And it can be as high as 512 or even more. Um, and, and 64 is uh, pretty much a sweet spot or 128 based on the cluster behavior. Now, when we ran through the HDFS acceleration project, uh, we could see a big jump in utilization. So we could drive better results out of this. So this is Mr. Data, you know, going through the proliferation of distributed file systems. Now, here you will see what you're familiar with, Lister, Orange FSF, you know, we see more and more adoption around this stage um, where the HPC community, HPC community is uh, using this. Okay. And uh, most of our gear is Cloudera certified um, right now. So if um, any of the, the companies have um, restrictions around certifications and things like that, um, this is Cloudera certified and um, we're bringing on more and more applications to um, get more done. Now, if, you're, if folks are interested in using a cluster, um, there's an EMC 1000 node cluster, or analytics cluster, that's available for use. In fact, NASA and others are using this um, for any of their analysis. And also, it, it has like 24 petabytes of physical storage. So there's a ton of storage for you to put your data on, run your analysis, and you know, get the results. And if you want to try anything uh, around that. Plus, we have in-house clusters, which are much smaller, like 6, 10, 8. Um, you can use that as well. Now, this is one of the, co um, Cassandra is the NoSQL database in uh, Hadoop, uh, rather big data world. Um, what we saw essentially is just using IP, IP or IB versus other vanilla uh, you know, uh, Ethernet frameworks, we got much better latency. And Cassandra is all about latency. So you can think about Cassandra as one very large database um, it, it, where it's split across all the nodes, and essentially it does uh, NoSQL. Okay, so this is mainly, you know, bandwidth-wise, we're the highest latency, it's lower, power efficiency, scalability, um, linear growth in performance as the cluster size scale. So from a scale perspective, we're, you know, very well there. So we have no issues from scalability aspects. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.